Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. We took a brief break for the Thanksgiving holiday, but we're happy to be back, and we will continue to offer these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of the screen. Today, I'm joined by two guests. First, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, who's a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Jennifer will give an update about trends we're seeing in the COVID-19 data. Then Dr. Bill Moss is executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update on COVID-19 vaccines. I'm now going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Jennifer, first to you. Since we were last together, all eyes have shifted to the Omicron variant. What do we know now and how do you think our knowledge is likely to evolve in the weeks to come? Thank you, Lainey. Yes, um, the, the short answer is we don't know a lot now, but we will know more in the weeks to come. Um, I just wanna review sort of where we are in part because um, how we will uh, assess um, the, the um, challenges posed by this variant very much depends on um, the sort of the, the situation that we're in now. Um, we, of course, are coming out of a holiday week, and so the, the data are a bit um, unusual because we know that states um, tend not to report um, COVID uh, data over the, the weekend. So the, the case numbers and trends um, have to account for, for the, those gaps in reporting. But as generally speaking, um, case numbers are continuing uh, to rise in the, in the U.S., which of course is not a great place to be starting from when we're talking about adding in potentially a, a new variant. Um, we are seeing cases rise in many uh, states, um, including um, now we're seeing uh, rises in, in the Northeast, um, which had um, uh, been a bit later to see a, a case increases. You know, we saw the, the South and then we saw uh, the Midwest, but now we're also seeing cases in the Northeast. Of all the states uh, right now, of course, the situation is most worrisome in Michigan. Um, Michigan remains uh, um, the state with some of the highest um, cases per capita and seeing increases, as well as um, they're also seeing um, increases in hospitalizations and deaths. Now, I mentioned that we were seeing case increases in the Northeast, and that may be confusing um, given that the Northeast generally has um, high uh, levels of vaccination. So far, we don't see the same kind of increases um, in uh, hospitalizations and deaths. Um, we may, because we know that those things lag, uh, increases in, in states, in cases, but we also, um, I, I'm hopeful that the rises that we may see in the future um, may not uh, be as high. And I think that's an important thing for us to keep in mind when we're talking about um, case trends is that what do, are we seeing in terms of translations uh, to hospitalizations and deaths? Overall, where we are right now um, is that uh, we are seeing worrisome trends in terms of increases, but the metrics that I track most closely in terms of um, my worries in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, um, we are better off this time this year than we were this time last year. Now, no guarantees, of course, but that is make me very hopeful. And, you know, it's very much likely that the, the vaccines are, are, are um, making uh, an impact there. Um, one area that I remain very much concerned about is in testing. Our test positivity nationally is uh, very high, over over 5%, um, It's and it's increasing. And what this is always a sign of is that we need to do more testing. We need to cast a wider net to find infections. Um, this week, new actions um, announced by the administration to expand access to um, testing, 
potentially to require insurers to reimburse people for the tests that they purchase. Um, I am completely supportive of any effort to reduce the financial costs of purchasing um, at-home tests, um, but I'm not yet convinced that um, requiring um, insurers to reimburse people is going to lead to the kind of uptake that we need and the broad access and, and truly reduce the financial barriers to testing. These tests are most um, valuable when we can use them a lot and use them um, with repetition. And um, to be able to do that, people need you know, near free or free and, and easy access to these tests. Um, turning a bit to the international stage, uh, there still remain um, a number of areas of the world that are seeing um, concerning a, uh, case increases. Uh, we uh, remain very much concerned about uh, Eastern Europe and a number of countries there, but now um, we're seeing some of other parts of Europe seeing uh, case increases as well. And we maintain a list of uh, countries uh, with uh, greater than a million size population and uh, and which ones of those are seeing um, increases of 10% or more. Um, this week, there's 43 countries on that list and 35% of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are also now um, seeing other parts of, of the globe um, becoming um, uh, concerningly affected. Now, Elena, you opened with asking about the Omicron variant, um, still preliminary, <laughs> very limited information. Um, I think the, the body of evidence we have so far, which is very, very limited, um, suggests the potential that this may be um, more transmissible um, than uh, the uh, Delta variant. Um, we don't yet have any evidence of increased severity, but we could develop that evidence. And one of the concerns is that so far, a lot of the cases have been reported to be mild or asymptomatic. Um, but we also know that surveillance for this variant um, is very much biased, including there's a heavy weighting on travelers, and travelers are typically young and healthy. So if the variant does find its way into older, more susceptible populations, our understanding of, of, of what it is could change. So I really have to stress that right now, and I think it's important to put into context all of the news reports. We are now hearing about cases throughout the United States. We're hearing about cases, and I think it was something like 36 countries today um, that are reporting cases. I think at this point, we should assume this variant is near everywhere, um, but how much of it, we really don't know, and where it started, we really don't know, and who it's affecting, we really don't know, because our surveillance is, is very limited and also potentially biased to be looking for it only in certain populations and only in certain places. So I say that as a word of caution to try to interpret every news story and new development, knowing that as we are trying to learn about this in real time, our data to understand it are very much imperfect and, and things could, could very much change. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention also about um, uh, the variant is um, stay tuned for sure, um, but um, you know expect that the the news is going to change in um, in in the coming weeks. Um, but that said, the the virus <laughs> that remains dominant is still the Delta variant. We have been dealing with this for months. We know what to do to control it, which is get vaccinated if you aren't. Still, you know, masks and all the other um, measures still work to um, re reduce um, transmission between people, and it's very likely that these are these tools will um, have effect against this new variant too, but let's not forget about the virus that's uh, most frequently out there while we're continuing to learn more about Omicron. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Before I turn to Bill, I wanna remind our audience, please do submit your questions for our experts in the box at the bottom of your, of your screen. I see your questions coming in and we'll turn to them shortly. Bill, since we were last together, there have been very significant developments with boosters in the U.S. I was hoping you could give us a booster update and then speak to the global vaccine situation. Yes, Lainey, thank you. And uh, those two are uh, perhaps related. But um, what we've seen over the past several weeks is really kind of a broadening and simplification of the of the guidelines and recommendations around booster doses. So just very simply, um, for the Pfizer, Moderna, mRNA vaccines, everyone 18 years and older who were, for whom it's been six months or more since they've received their second dose um, are eligible for a booster dose. And then for the Johnson & Johnson, it's the same uh, age group, 18 years and older, but two months or more after the, uh, uh, after the second dose. And the CDC guidelines are that uh, one can choose uh, which booster dose they'd like. So they're 
the, the guidelines kind of open up uh, for a choice as to which, uh, which type of vaccine an individual chooses to get for the booster dose. Now, the, the justification behind these, um, these recommendations on booster doses are, come from de observations of decreased vaccine effectiveness against infection and mild disease, and particularly in some uh, groups of people, such as uh, adults older than 65 years of, of age, but this has also been observed in healthcare workers. Um, and this lower vaccine effectiveness, um, it, it's a bit difficult to tease out, you know, how much that of that is due actually to waning immunity and how much uh, is due to the uh, the more contagious Delta variant. So it may be a, a combination of those two that we're seeing. Um, and in the clinical trials, it was clearly seen that a booster dose as expected, you know, results in, in uh, an increase in neutralizing antibody uh, levels. So that's, that's very important. Uh, but it's also important to understand, you know, what those, uh, those, that increase in antibody levels means. We know that those, uh, that these kind of uh, bursts in, in uh, neutralizing antibodies after a, a vaccination, whether it's a booster dose or a second dose, you know, it is transitory. Um, and we also know that there are other aspects of our immune responses that are very, very important, particularly our memory immune responses that consists of both T cells and B cells. And, you know, I, this is what's really, I think, responsible for the protection against severe disease, the hospitalizations and deaths. And Jennifer mentioned, you know, those are the metrics that she watches very closely. And so we, we have to be, I think, cautious about what we're really achieving with booster doses um, and what we can expect. We, we, we don't know as much about the impact of these booster doses on our memory responses. Are they making our memory responses stronger? Are they making our, our memory responses kind of more targeted uh, to the virus? Now, the uh, emergence of the Omicron variant has um, resulted in even, even further kind of simpl simplification of the CDC recommendations. Um, which were a little bit um, complex because they used the word, you know, individuals who should be uh, receive a booster dose, and that included adults over 50 years of age and those living in long-term care facilities, um, and those who may receive a, a, a booster dose. And on Monday of this past week, the CDC really um, basically simplified that even further and said that all adults uh, in the United States should receive uh, booster doses. Now, we know Pfizer is seeking, uh, actually on Tuesday, uh, submitted documents to the FDA seeking authorization for booster doses for those uh, 16 and 17 years of age who aren't covered under the current uh, authorization. And we still have some you know, uh, uncertainty, I'll say, about whether booster doses will be uh, necessary for younger children, for those in that 12 to 15 year age group, or even that five to 11 year age group. Um, and when you get down into younger ages, uh, there's perhaps more of a trade-off um, or more of a calculus, a risk benefit calculus about the, the potential benefits and risks uh, of booster doses. Um, and then uh, there's been a lot of talk recently, Lainey, over the past couple of days about Omicron specific boosters and the vaccine manufacturers are working on these. Uh, we've been given a timeline of about three months, um, but this is one of the great advantages of these vaccine platforms such as mRNA or adenovirus vectored vaccines that they're relatively straightforward to swap out the genetic recipe uh, for the original Wuhan strain with the Omicron uh, variant and all its mutations um, and really have Omicron specific boosters. So we, I, I anticipate that we'll see that. Now this, uh, all the, the concern about uh, Omicron in particular, and I, I should say we don't yet know, as Jennifer highlighted, we don't yet know what, uh, how much protection we're going to get uh, uh, with our current vaccines against Omicron. And I, like many others, think we're going to see some reduced uh, effectiveness against infection, but hopefully sustained protection against severe disease. But as uh, the high income countries and upper middle income countries, you know, uh, move to provide booster doses to their, uh, their populations, that, that I think will further exacerbate the global inequities we're seeing um, in vaccine distribution. Um, more than uh, about or about 
4.3 billion people worldwide have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, about 56% of the popula global population. That's a remarkable achievement. 45% uh, of the global population are estimated to be fully vaccinated. Again, a really remarkable uh, achievement, but we still have these gross inequities. And the New York Times estimates that about 75% of all vaccine doses have gone to high and upper middle income countries and fewer than 1% uh, have been administered in low-income countries. And just to highlight some of those disparities, at the high end, United Arab Emirates, Emirates has vaccinated, fully vaccinated 90% of the population. Cuba, 81% fully vaccinated. Portugal, 87%. Even mainland China, 79%. Here in the United States, uh, we're at 59%. We're not doing as well as many countries. And even, in, let's say, in the uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, 30% uh, of people have received a booster dose. Now, if we look at the other end of the spectrum, and it's really in Africa, and and uh, this is, you know, Jennifer highlighted where we're seeing the increased cases. Um, Ethiopia, a very large country, only 1.3% of the population is fully vaccinated. Nigeria, another very populous country, 1.7. Democratic Republic of the Congo, 2.4%. Where I work in Zambia and have many friends and colleagues, only 3.9%. So Africa as a whole has received or only about 10% of the population in uh, Africa has received a, a single dose. And so this is, this is a huge global problem. And I know we've talked about this before and many people have flagged this um, and there, we really need to do all we can um, uh, to uh, decrease this, this, uh, these inequities because we're all gonna pay the price. We're, we're gonna see if there's widespread transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, as Jennifer kind of uh, hinted at, um, we're gonna see more variants. Um, and I'm just worried, uh, Lainey, that um, this emphasis now on booster doses, uh, and I'm not saying it's unjustified, but on booster doses as being uh, one of our big tools for the, uh, to fight the Omicron variant, um, that that's just going to further exacerbate these inequities. Thanks very much, Bill. Before I turn to the questions that are coming in, I want to remind our audience that we do have a subscription weekly newsletter from the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. It's called The Week in COVID-19, and it's a wonderful way to get the latest analysis from our experts about the virus itself, variants, vaccines, and other critical developments delivered to your inbox every Monday. I'm now going to turn to the questions that are coming in, and no surprise, there are quite a few today. Jennifer, I'm going to, to start with you and several questions that relate to Omicron. How do we interpret the growth in cases in South Africa? Is the story likely one about Omicron itself, or is it a combination of, of other factors? We don't know for sure, but my guess is it's a combination of factors. Um, there seems to be clear growth in cases. Um, what is facilitating that, encouraging it, resulting in it, if it's purely the virus, or is it a clustering of, of vulnerabilities or um, just transmission factors it is not known. Um, but I think there is reason to believe that um, this virus may have some, some transmission advantage in, in being able to result in more cases. Um, more quickly. The, this is always a very hard thing to tease out in epidemiology. So always a kind of asterisk next to those statements. Um, but we also know that we are now looking harder for the virus. And this is one of the challenges is that once we hear about something, we go looking harder for it and we start finding it. And initially we go looking harder, looking harder in the places where we think it's most likely to occur, which is based on our observation on the initial cases and who they are and where they've been. And that may reinforce some of the bias in our surveillance. And it really isn't until we amass much larger data sets that encompass more types of cases that we begin to learn better how this virus is. I mean, we're still debating to some extent uh, whether the Delta variant is more severe. I think we now have more evidence that reduces our worries about that, but it's just to, to say that it's, it's taken months to really sort that out. Um, and that's just why I want to stress is that while this is a difficult and hard process and that may feel very um, concerning for people who are worried is this is you know what's this going to mean for us 
um, I think we have to come back to some things that we very much expect to be true, which is that um, the tools that we have been using to protect ourselves are likely to give us protection. And that um, in the meantime, as we're learning about this, we can't forget about the virus th that we're most likely to encounter. And that at this point remains Delta. Thanks, Jennifer. Bill, a question for you that starts off with vaccine history, which I think you'll enjoy. Thank so in the, in the history of vaccines, it's unusual to um, give a boost to a healthy individual so soon after an initial dose. Knowing that, what does that mean about the quality of the vaccines that we're working with today relative to COVID? Yeah, so it, it's a great question. And it, you know, part, some of it comes down to, you know, what do we consider the primary series? And, you know, this, um, you know, because of the pandemic, um, the timing of the doses uh, was selected by Pfizer and Moderna, you know, to have that, you know, first two doses, you know, one month, three weeks, four weeks apart, um, and have just a two dose series, you know, was done, um, you know, was done uh, to really kind of expedite expedite uh, the the regulatory process and get vaccines out as soon as possible. Um, so we do have a number of vaccines, uh, you know, particularly uh, uh, protein-based vaccines or, or killed vaccines, where we do need to give a number of doses in order to get a good response. I mean, a, an example would be tetanus toxoid to protect us against uh, tetanus. So it's not unusual to have, um, you know, a multiple dose series or to have a, a booster dose. Um, and it, so that's part of the question or part of the answer. Um, the other thing is, um, it also depends upon, and we've talked about this before, kind of what are we asking our vaccines to do? Um, and, you know, because of the early high really success of the of the phase tr three trials short in the sh in the several months after people were vaccinated where people had very high neutralizing antibodies um uh you know and we saw uh good vaccine effectiveness against infection and asymptomatic infection um you know but that's a high bar uh and we're not going to be able to sustain that so i actually think these vaccines are probably doing what we should expect them to do and that is inducing uh, good memory immune responses and protecting us from severe disease and so in that sense um i would say you know these vaccines are performing quite well um, uh, and the, these booster doses are to help individuals who aren't like older uh, adults who aren't uh, developing uh, good memory immune responses. But I, I think we're asking a lot to, to ask them to pre actually prevent infection. Thanks, Bill. Um, I'm going to stay with you, but change topics a bit. So when when you were speaking about um, different countries within Africa and the very small percentages of their populations mm -hmm. that have been vaccinated, what to any extent is the role of hesitancy in there? Is it all about supply or is hesitancy a factor? Yes. Um, no, hesitancy is a factor. And I, I remember early on when vaccines were just being rolled out, Lainey, we, I, I used to talk about what I called the four Ds as a simple framework for thinking about a successful vaccine rollout. And that is doses, having sufficient doses, the delivery, being able to get those doses into the arms of people, demand uh, on the demand side, and having the data to track it. Um, and, you know, countries in so, uh, uh, some of the resource poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa have challenges with all four of those Ds. Um, so it, there's definitely, I think the number one problem has been the supply. Um, and I think that's going to continue into 2022. Um, but there are also issues about getting doses that are in country into the arms of people um, and having the infrastructure and cold chain to do so. And there are challenges, uh, increasing challenges with the demand side and on, on vaccine hesitancy, much more than we've seen, for example, with routine childhood infections in which the hesitancy has been quite low. There are certainly pockets of hesitancy around childhood vaccines, but certainly not in the extent, uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa to the extent that we've seen in the United States. So this is a newer phenomenon related to the COVID-19 vaccines. Thanks, Bill. And thank you for bringing back, or I should say resurrecting the four uh, Ds. That's one of our CRC greatest hits. We <laughs> haven't talked about them in a while.
Um, Jennifer, in, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that it's a safe assumption at this point that Omicron is, is everywhere. So given that observation, what are your thoughts about the travel bans that we've seen imposed over the last couple of days? Uh, I have not been convinced that that was the way to respond, in part because we know that it's already having deleterious effects on the response um, in the sense that um, now scientists in South Africa are, are having trouble getting in the chemicals they need to do the testing and to study this virus um, in the way that all of us need them to do so that we can understand um, what it means for us. Um, Listen, I get it. On paper, this idea that you hear about the scary thing happening somewhere else in the world, what you want to do is make sure it doesn't come here. That absolutely makes sense. But in order for us to be able to do that, we need to know where in the world the virus is so that we can know where to shut down travel from. Just because a, a scientist in one country found something does not mean that that's where it started. That doesn't even mean that that's where the most of it is occurring. And now as, as other governments have woken up to this threat and they go looking, they're starting to find it. And they're starting to find a lot more of it. And so the numbers of countries that are reporting cases is growing. Now that some people may interpret that as it's spreading around the globe, but we actually don't know that. We haven't seen the, the true list of when these cases have occurred and which ones happened first. Um, it's likely that we are just turning up the things that have been there that we just didn't know about before. So I have to put a note of caution on that. And to say that, you know, we have to think about the larger picture here, which is that if we want to continue to find these things and to learn about them and to get early warning of them, we can't immediately respond in punitive ways. Travel restrictions are punitive. They harm countries, they, they eat into their, their economic development, and they also slow down our response to them. So I would much rather see, and I'm glad to see um, you know, the administration looking harder at this, that we just try to make travel safer as opposed to, to restricting it in the first place. Thanks, Jennifer. And we're closing in on 1230, so you'll get the last word for today's briefing. I'd like to thank Jennifer Nuzzo and Bill Moss for joining me today and give a big thank you to everyone who joined us and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. As a reminder, we do offer these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. Our next briefing will be Friday, December 17th. I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, thanks and stay safe.